uh, in this uh, page 56, it was mentioned here that the, these four are worthy of a monument. And Ajahn mentioned that monument means to pass. <laughs> but there was nothing mentioned whether we enshrine the relics in the stupas or not. Yeah, will, that, will, will, will there be relics to be enshrined in this stupa for these four people? Um, it doesn't say that here, yeah. but it says that, I think it says that in the, uh, towards the end of the Mahaparibbana Sutta, when the relics of the Buddha are divided out, uh, that's where it says that the each, each, there's eight groups of people from different areas, they get one portion of relics each, and they say they will put it in a stupa. That's why it says that. Uh, but in this, then, in this paragraph, it, it was silent. It's then mentioned that these two yeah. masters who had to have a relics and shrine. And yeah. then you label it relics of the Buddha yeah. or relics of the Pacheka Buddha, so and so, and so on and so forth, isn't it? Yeah, so it doesn't say here. Yeah. So, so you're right. It, it doesn't actually say. So here it looks like it could just be a monument without yeah. any relics. Empty That's what it looks like yeah, here. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But later on, at the end of the sutta, they talk about putting, uh, making a stupa around the relics. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um. There was a fellow called Alan Tan who was here yesterday. Has, is he, has he left? He was sitting. He didn't come in today. Oh, okay, okay. Because he asked me some questions, and uh, I just so I just was going to answer, but uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Huh? Okay. Let's continue. So, um, yeah, so then we, I skip a little bit forward again. You see all the little dots there. I, I'm not doing everything, it's, it's too much. And um, then we have the next section here. Uh, when he, he said this, uh, uh, I'm not sure what that was, but Venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, Sir, please don't become fully extinguished in this little ham hamlet, this jungle hamlet, this branch hamlet. There are other great cities such as Champa, Rajagaha, Savati, Saketa, Kosambi, and Benares. Let the Buddha become fully extinguished there. There are many well-to-do aristocrats, these are the Katyas, Brahmins and householders there who are devoted to the Buddha. They will perform the rites of venerating the, uh, the realized one's corpse. Don't uh, say, and then the Buddha replies, don't say that, Ananda. Don't say that this is a little hamlet, a jungle hamlet, a branch hamlet. Um, so uh, here we have the Venerable Ananda would like the Buddha to pass away in a suitably large city, uh, not a small, tiny little back, back of the woods place, uh, like, uh, you know, a uh, backward place like Kushinara, uh, because this was just the capital of a tiny kingdom uh, of the Malans, and the Malans were just this tiny little part of the larger ca uh, kingdom of Kosala, and there wasn't, there wasn't much there. And uh, you can see here how uh, we all kind of want our teachers to have a prestige, yeah? And it was no different in those days in ancient time of the Buddha. They wanted the Buddha to have a prestigious funeral that kind of was suited for uh, the Buddha's standing in the community at that time. Uh, but uh, the Buddha is obviously thinking differently, yeah? He is quite happy to pass away in uh, Kushinara. And uh, why would the Buddha have done this, and uh, uh, I think maybe part of the point is precisely that the Buddha does not want uh, kind of all of these over the top, uh, you know, uh, people maybe you know doing things over the top. That he actually wants things to be quite humble. He is not interested in, in things that have to do with the ego, have to do with glorifying individuals or glorifying himself. Uh, he probably wants to lead by example. Uh, even I can die in a small place like this. Uh, so much more. All the rest of you, you should also be humble in the way you live your monastic life. Uh, maybe saying that to the monks. So I think a large part of this may be just leading by example. Uh, 
It doesn't matter where you pass away here. Secondly, maybe because uh, if you die in a big city, maybe there's more chances of war afterwards, yeah? Uh, maybe there will be cause more problems. Uh, but if you die in a small place, then people in a small place are likely to be more humble and more willing to share the relics. But if you died in Rajagaha, then King Ajatasattu might take all the relics and they might cause serious problems afterwards. Uh. One of the things that we will not see is that after the Buddha passed away, there almost was a war, yeah, very close, precisely because of the relics of the Buddha, uh, because the, the various, all the various um, groups, um, nationalities, nations around that area wanted to have their share of the relics, so they always almost happened. Uh. So the Buddha does not want to uh, die in one of the great cities, and this list of great cities is actually quite interesting. Uh. Uh, these are the capitals of uh, the main uh, countries in that area. Uh, yeah? uh, Champa was the capital of the Anga country, uh, which was next to Magadha, which capital was Rajagaha. And then to the north of the river you had the... Uh, oh, I, I, I think I made a mistake the other day. I said Vesali. Why isn't Vesali? Shouldn't Vesali be there? Champa, this is... Uh, okay, anyway, what it, no, I think, yeah. So th then you have Savati, which was, I think maybe Sali, I think, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. Savati being the capital of the uh, Kosalan kingdom, uh, uh, Kosambi being the capital of the Vangsa kingdom to the south, Benares being part of Kasi, a small only little kingdom, and Saketa was the second big city in Kosala. These were the main city. And Vesa I thought Vesali was not this, but actually it's not there. So I, that, that was my mistake earlier on. Uh. So this is interesting because uh, one of the cities missing from that list is uh, Pataliputta, yeah, which is now Patna, which later on became the w amazing capital of the Magadhan Empire, which was Ashoka's capital and also the capital of a few kings before Ashoka. But at this point, it was nothing. It was just a small village. It is called Pataligama in the suttas. Pataligama means a village. And that again shows us some of the historical uh, time period in which the suttas were written down. They were written down before Pataliputta became a big city. It became a big city soon after the Buddha passed away. Uh, but at this point it was very small. And these little details like that, uh, they can help us to reconstruct some of the history, which is helpful again in reconstructing the chronology of the suttas and all of this. So all of these things help us, aid us in uh, establishing what are the earliest suttas. Uh, History always throws light on, on these issues, and that's why it is interesting here. And one of the things I mentioned the other day, that uh, I don't know if it escaped you or not, but I mentioned that in one of the other uh, suttas, the Mahapanibbana suttas, uh, Kushinara is mentioned as the, uh, not Kushinara, Kapilavattu is mentioned as the seventh city. Yeah, this is found in one of the Chinese translations. You have the seven cities, Kapilavattu. Which is interesting, and, and, I, and as I mentioned before, the reason why I think Kapilavattu is added there is precisely because the legend of the Buddha starts to grow, and in that legend of the Buddha, Kapilavattu is made into this magnificent city here. Yeah, this enormous place. If you look at the archaeological evidence, it would have been a tiny little, tiny little thing, yeah? But in, according to the sutta, it's this magnificent city. So they probably thought, oh yeah, we forgot, Kaplavatu isn't there, but we know it's a big city, so it should be there. Okay, better add it in. Uh. This is how these things happen, yeah? People try to do the right thing, but actually what they do, they help us to distort history and makes it more difficult to re reconstruct later on. Uh. So this is more likely to be the original list, the list you have here. Uh. So uh, anyway, so this is uh, w uh, so this is what he says. The Buddha does not agree, and then you get this strange little paragraph that comes next. Uh, once upon a time, once upon a time means uh, means story, means fairy tale. Yeah, this is kind of the signal. Uh, Buddha Pubang in Pali is very similar to once upon a time in English. There was a king named Maha Sudasana the very good-looking one, uh, that's what it means, who was a wheel-turning monarch, uh, a just and principled king. His dominion extended to all four sides. Uh, he achieved stability in the country and possessed the seven treasures. Uh, his capital was at Kushinara, <laughs> which at that time was named Kusavati. 
It stretched for 12 leagues from east to west and 7 leagues from north to south. A league is a yorjana, is the Pali word yorjana, it means roughly how far a pair of oxen can pull a cart in one day, and that is something like 16 kilometers. So 12 leagues is almost 200 kilometers. So it stretches 200 kilometers one way and then over over 100 in the other direction, so it would have been a pretty impressive city, uh, yeah? pretty large. Uh, I don't, is there any existing cities in the world today that are that large? Maybe there are, I'm not sure, but uh, for that time it would have been enormous. Uh, the royal capital of Kusavati was successful, prosperous, populous, full of people with plenty of food. It was just like Alakamanda, the royal capital of the gods, which is successful, prosperous, populous, full of spirits. Not full of people, but full of spirits, with plenty of food. <laughs> Kusavati was never free of ten sounds by day or night, namely the sound of elephants, of horses, of chariots, of drums, of clay drums, of arched harps, really, of singing, of horns, of gongs and handbells, and the cry, eat, drink, and be merry, as the tenth. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is, uh, is interesting, isn't it? H here, the Buddha is supposed to tell Ananda that actually Kushinara really is actually more magnificent than any of the cities in modern India, in, in other words, at the time of the Buddha. It is even greater. Yeah? Yeah, and uh, uh, this particular Mahasudasana, there is a whole sutta found in the Diga Nikaya about which is called the Mahasudasana Sutta, which goes over 30 pages and just explains the marvelous reign of King Mahasudasana and how wonderful it is and how he had 84,000 palaces and 84,000 wives and 84,000 elephants and 84,000 this and everything was gold and silver and gems and everything was marvelous and the people loved him and he loved the people and he was, everything is just really extravagant, way over the top. And um, so you can see what is probably happening here, is, is that uh, people were a bit concerned about the Buddha passing away in Kushinara. The Buddha had made that conscious decision because, probably because he thought it was appropriate, uh, but the other, nobody else thought it was appropriate, yeah? So they had to kind of raise things up a little bit and make them a bit better. So instead of the Buddha passing away in Rajaga or whatever, he passed away in this absolutely magnificent place called Kusavati, or, or which is the ancient name for uh, Kushinara, and they make it into something magnificent. It's as if they cannot bear that the Buddha passes away in a small village. This is not worthy of our Buddha. Our Buddha is more important than that. And then they build up this incredibly magnificent story. Uh, in the other versions of the Mahapanibbana Sutta, the story of uh, Mahasudasana is actually included in the Sutta. So at this point you get another 30 pages long story of that ancient capital included. Uh, this is how there sometimes is a little bit of evolution in the suttas, especially in the narratives, uh, how things can be expanded a little bit. Uh, I think it is, to me, it is fairly obvious that this is not original. It doesn't actually, I don't think the Buddha ever actually said this. I could be wrong, uh, but uh, that, that to me seems to be the uh, obvious explanation for what is going on here. Uh, anyway, that's uh, my bias probably, but uh, anyway, so uh, let us. Um, Continue her. Go, Ananda, uh, into Kushinara and inform the Malas. Uh, this very day, uh, Vasettas, in the last watch of the night, the last third of the night, uh, the realized one will become fully extinguished. Uh, come forth, Vasettas, come forth, Vasettas, don't regret it later, thinking the realized one became fully extinguished in our village district. Uh, but we didn't get the chance to see him in his final hour. Yes, sir, replied Ananda. Then he robed up, take, took his bowl and robe, and entered Kushinara with a companion. So you can see here, in those days too, they had companions, the monks, when they traveled around, just like they often have today. Now, at that time, a wanderer named Subhadda was residing near Kushinara. He heard that on that very day, in the last watch of the night, the ascetic Gotama would become fully extinguished. He thought, I have heard that Brahmins of the past who were elders and senior, the teachers of teachers said, only rarely 
the realized ones arise in the world, perfected ones, fully awakened Buddhas. And this very day, in the last watch of the night, the ascetic Gautama will become fully extinguished. This state of uncertainty has come up in me. I am quite confident that the Buddha is capable of teaching me so that I can give up this state of uncertainty. Then Subhadda went to the Malian Sal Grove at Upavatana, approached Ananda and said to him, Master Ananda, I have heard that Brahmins of the past who were elders and senior, the teachers of teachers said, only rarely do realized ones arise in the world, perfected ones, fully awakened Buddhas. And this very day, in the last watch of the night, they said the Gautama will become fully extinguished. This state of uncertainty has come up, up in me. I am quite confident that the Buddha is capable of teaching me, so I can give up this state of uncertainty. Master Ananda, please let me see the ascetic Gautama. So um, the Buddha is about to die. Yeah, he's kind of getting very close. Uh, and um, I, I stopped before there. There's all, all of this bowing down by the various malas or whatever. Uh, I've kind of chopped that out. So, so Subhadda is pretty much the last person in the world. Yeah, the Buddha is about to die. Who is asking to see him? So uh, you can imagine that it would have been difficult for Ananda to say, yes, we can see him. It was more likely, well, he's dying, you know, leave him alone. It would be a more natural explanation at this point. Uh, and this is sort of what happens. Uh, um, when, when he had spoken thus, Ananda said, enough, Reverend Subhadda, do not trouble the Blessed One, he is tired. <laughs> For a second time and a third time, Subhadda asked Ananda, and a third time, Ananda refused. So he was just doing the job of a good attendant, I think. When somebody is about to die, it's the wrong time to uh, ask them about uh, the Dhamma. The Buddha heard that discussion between Ananda and Subhadda. He said to Ananda, enough, Ananda, don't obstruct Subhadda. Let him see the realized one. For whatever he asks me, he will only be looking for understanding, not trouble. And he will quickly understand any answer I give to his question. Then Ananda said to the wondrous Subhadda, Go, Reverend Subhadda, the Buddha uh, is taking the time for you. And this is uh, kind of the Kind of the amazing thing about the Buddha, he is, you know, lying on his deathbed. He will pass away in maybe just a f few hours, maybe not even a few hours, maybe just a few minutes from for all that we know. It may not be very far away at all. Uh, come to the very, very end of his life, uh, and yet he uh, receives visitors. Uh, yeah, to the very, to the very last minute, uh, he allows people to come, come in and see him and talk to him. Uh, and this again, this just reminds us that the per whole purpose of the Buddha's life. Uh, is to have compassion, is to help people. That's why he exists. And because that's why he exists, he will uh, do that till the very last minute, to the very end. He will act from compassion and kindness to help people to see the truth, uh, because that is the whole purpose of his life. Uh, so even if he had to do it on the last breath, he probably would do it on his last breath. He would say, practice harder, then he would die or something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh. So, um, uh, then the wondrous Subhadda went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, yeah, you always have polite conversation first, uh, he sat down to one side and said to the Buddha, Master Gautama, there are those ascetics and Brahmins uh, who lead an order and a community and teach a community. Uh, they are well-known and famous religious founders, uh, regarded as holy by many people, uh, namely uh, Purana Kasapa, Makkali Gosala, Niganta Nataputta, Sanjaya Belatiputta, Pakkuda Kachayana, and Ad Ajita Kesakambala. Uh, yeah, they are regarded as holy. The Pali for that is Sadhu, Sam Sadhu Samata. Oops. What's going on here? Mm. Can you? Is it still working? Yeah, okay. Maybe just, uh, uh, I don't know, Mara messing around or something. Huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. So um, the Pali word is sadhu 
Samatha, yeah, and the word sadhu uh, existed in those days in India. And if you go to India today, the holy, so-called holy people are still called sadhus. Uh, yeah, you go to India, you see the sadhus of India. So this is kind of one of those ancient words that have existed all the way since the time of the Buddha. We have one of the monks in our monastery. He is from India originally. He's from the Punjab. And when he goes back to visit his family, he is a Sikh originally, when he goes back to his family, all the neighbors says, oh, the neighbor's son, they have a sadhu as a son, let's go and see him. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the son is the sadhu, so then all the neighbors come, yeah, and they come in and they want to see the sadhu in the neighbor's house. It's kind of nice, isn't it? It's, this sounds just like India, because the sadhus are always special in Indian culture. It's a very religious society, and if you are a holy person, people want to see you, they want to talk to you, to see if you have any real wisdom or what, what not. Uh, this is how India, how India works. Yeah? And uh, the, these words are exactly the same uh, as they were at that time. Uh, and these six people here, these are the main the most famous ones according to the Buddhist text, the six leaders of various, six various uh, sects or six various religions, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and they had their own kind of strange uh, doctrines. One of them is the Niganta Nataputta, who was the leader of the Jains. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them was the leader of the Ajivakas that we talk, looked at before, uh, which I think was, was it Makkali Gosala? Or Purana Kaspa, well, I think one of those. Uh, and so they all had their own doctrines. Uh. And then he says, according to their own claims, uh, did all of these have direct knowledge, uh, or none of them, or only some? So he is asking the Buddha, did these, were these enlightened or were they not? Uh, did they know what they were talking about or not? Uh, and uh, so what does the Buddha answer to that? Uh, and this is what he says, uh, enough Subhada, let that be. I shall teach you the Dhamma, the, the teaching. Uh, listen and pay close attention. Uh, I will speak. Uh, yes, sir, Subhada replied. Uh, and the Buddha said this. Uh, Subhada, in whatever teaching and training, the noble eightfold path is not found. There is no true recluse found there. No second ascetic, no third ascetic, no fourth ascetic. Uh, in whatever teaching and training the Noble Eightfold Path is found, uh, there you find a true ascetic, uh, a second ascetic, the third ascetic, and a fourth ascetic. Uh. In this teaching and training the Noble Eightfold Path is found. Uh, only here is there a true ascetic, a second ascetic, a third ascetic, and a fourth ascetic. Uh. Other sects are empty of ascetics. Uh, were these mendicants to practice well, the world would not be empty of perfected ones. So um, the last part kind of spoils the first part a little bit, uh, but the first part is very beautiful where all he really says, instead of saying that these teachers, they, they don't know what they're talking about and kind of saying Buddhism is best and whatever, instead of saying that, the Buddha st instead mentions the path of practice that is required for enlightenment. Yeah. And what he is saying here is that it's not really about what religion you belong to. It's not about, uh, you know, adhering to any particular thing. The only thing that really matters is what you do, how you live your life. And if you live your life in the right way, then it will have certain results. And that is why in the history uh, of Buddhism they talk about things like the Pacheka Buddhas, the private Buddhas or individual Buddhas. Uh, and these are people who become enlightened even though there is no Buddhism in the world, uh, even though they don't call themselves Buddhist, uh, they have somehow they have happened upon the Noble Eightfold Path, more or less by accident because there's no one to teach them, uh, and then they become enlightened because of that. Uh, but they're not really Buddhists. Yeah? They don't belong to an organized religion, anything like that. Or you could say they are Buddhists precisely because they practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Depends how you define these things. Uh, so, and in the same way, if someone were a Christian uh, and they practice the Noble Eightfold Path, well, they would become enlightened. Yeah? Would they still be Christian at the end? Probably not. <laughs> Right, because uh, the whole point of enlightenment is one of the things that you see, is you see that there is no self, there is no God, that's part of the kind of thing, if there is no God, can you be a Christian if there is no God? Uh, probably not, yeah, because I think that's kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of fundamental to Christianity, that there is a God, a Christianity without the God is probably not Christianity anymore. 
But uh, at least you can go a long way on the path and then you can maybe change your ideas when you get closer. But the point is that Buddhism is not a faith in any ordinary sense. Uh, it's not about believing something and then getting results. It's about the practice. It's the path that matters in Buddhism. And for that reason, it is not a religion in the ordinary sense of religion that we normally think about it, uh, where faith is the paramount thing. Here, the path is what matters. Uh, you don't have to call yourself a Buddhist. You can call yourself whatever you like. Uh, as long as you practice in the right way, you will have results. Uh, and this is a very beautiful answer to uh, Subhadda. Uh, and this is obviously what convinces him that the Buddha is right. Uh, then the Buddha, according to this, he says that only here there is the true ascetic, the second ascetic, third and fourth ascetics. These are the, the four ascetics, is the arahant, the non-returner, the ones returner, and the stream man. These are the four kind of ascetics here. Uh, uh, and uh, whether he said that or whether or not, I'm not sure. It kind of destroys the uh, point a little bit, in my opinion. But uh, anyway, and then he says other sects are empty of ascetics. Uh, uh, I haven't really checked that out. And uh, but uh, uh, anyway, let's let's just leave that. It doesn't really matter here. So, and where anyone practices well, then the world is not empty or perfected one. So something like that. Uh, and then uh, uh, Subhadda is so happy, he is so delighted, uh, he goes off and he thanks the Buddha for uh, clearing his doubts uh, and then he practices and then the Venerable Subhadda became one of the perfected ones uh, and he was the last personal disciple of the Buddha. He came to him on his deathbed, uh, the Buddha gave him the teaching and he, then he became an Arahant, isn't that That's quite amazing, towards the very, very end of the Buddha's life. Uh. Let's go on. Then the Buddha addressed Venerable Ananda. Now, Ananda, some of you might think uh, the teacher's dispensation has passed. Now we ha have no teacher. Uh, but you should not see it like this. The teaching and training that I have taught you and pointed out for you shall be your teacher after my passing away. Oh, we're getting very close now to the end. Uh, <laughs> don't turn the page because then you will see how close we are. So don't uh, stay <laughs> stay on this page for now. So and this is a very important uh, part right there at the very end, where the Buddha says that the Dhamma and the Vinaya, that's what he says, should be your teacher. I have after I have passed away, uh, and this is what we need to remember as well. Uh, I've been talking before about the thirty-seven Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, the thirty-seven aids to awakening, and here he says the same thing, but from a slightly different angle. Here he talks about the Dhamma and Vinaya, the doctrine and the t and the practice. Yeah, is what he mentions in this particular case. Uh, and just to remind you again that uh, these teachings are essentially what we call the four Nikayas. Uh, and uh, perhaps a little bit of the Kuddhaka Nikaya uh, and also parts of the Vinaya Pitika. That is the teaching after we have, after the Buddha passes away. Uh. And this is, uh, it's hard to really underestimate the importance of this uh, because we live in the world where personality worship is so common. Uh. People uh, take as their teachers all kind of people uh, except the Buddha. And very often those teachers become very famous because the Buddha is not there to kind of receive the final uh, respect or whatever, that respect goes to those teachers instead. Uh. So the sometimes they become like almost like Buddhas in the place of the Buddha almost. Yeah, They become worshipped in a way that really is not quite appropriate from the Sutta point of view. Uh. Because the one thing that we have in common as Buddhists uh, is that we have the Buddha as our teacher. Uh. And one of the beautiful things about that is precisely that we don't pay too much attention to personalities, uh, but instead we go to the Buddha as our final reference. Uh. This is the beauty of this. Uh, so we should really, the Buddhism is set up not to have too much personality worship, uh, but it seems inherent to human beings that we want to do that. Uh, we want to kind of have a living person that we can kind of bow down to and say, please show us the way, tell me, you know, uh, tell me whether I'm doing what is right or not, you know, and whatever. We want to have that authority there. Uh, but actually, uh, we are often better off not having that uh, because uh, very often what happens is that uh, those people, they are not as perfect as the Buddha. They will lead you astray sometimes. Sometimes they will lead you astray massively and you won't get anywhere on the path. You will not, certainly not get to the point where the Buddha wants to get you. Huh? 
And uh, so we are losing some of those beautiful aspects of Buddhism by not following how, what the, how the Buddha laid these things down uh, and by following his advice properly. And this is so common in Mahayana Buddhism. You go to Tibetan Buddhism where they have the four refuges. Yeah, the fourth one is the guru, the teacher. Yeah, guru means teacher. He is the fourth refuge. It's never a, sh never a she, by the way. It's always a he yeah, because they, they don't have many female teachers in Tibetan Buddhism. And so there they are putting the guru on up at the same level as the Buddha, which is madness. Yeah, it's completely, it doesn't really make any sense at all. And uh, that leads to lots of problems. And that's one of the reasons why I think, one of the reasons why there has been a lot, lot of problems in Tibetan Buddhism. Too much worship, too much power, too much authority. And it has led to a lot of scandals in Tibetan Buddhism over, over recent years. Yeah? This is what happens. But we shouldn't, you know, this, we shouldn't as Theravadan Buddhists think that we are pure either. Because actually it's happening in Therav Theravada Buddhism as well. Not perhaps in quite the same way as in Tibetan Buddhism, because they are slightly different uh, ways of doing things, but it's happening here as well. Uh, here also you have people with too much power, too much personality worship, and then it creates similar kind of problems. Uh, and very often if you ask some of these teachers, well shouldn't we be reading the word of the Buddha? They would say, yeah, it's too hard to understand, yeah, uh, you don't find everything in there, and then they kind of guide the disciple back to them again. Uh, and very often that is not coming from a selfish point of view. It's more coming because the teachers themselves are ignorant about the suttas. Uh, because this is something that's happened for many generations. So nobody really knows what's in the suttas. Uh, and that's why they say these things. I don't, they don't say it because they you know, want to uh, kind of build up wrong view or anything like that. It's just because of ignorance. That's why these things happen. Uh, and that is why I think that you know, there is a lot of bad things coming out about Theravada Buddhism as well. A lot of abuse happening there as well. You read some of the stories coming out of Thailand sometimes and other places. And it is bound to happen. Wherever there is power, too much power, wrong power, abuse happens as a consequence. So very, very important advice, this idea, go back, take the Dhamma, the suttas, the teachings. This should be the final in a final analysis, what really is the teaching that we should all be looking up to? Uh, and the beauty of that is that we have something behind all of us, something more to be respected than any individual, and that is the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. And we can all bow down to that. In that case, it makes us all more equal. Uh, yeah, it puts us all roughly on the same level, instead of having these enormous hierarchies uh, within Buddhism. So. Uh, there you are, a very important point, and, and uh, I think sometimes these little points are underestimated, the power of these things. Uh, the Buddha doesn't say that Mahakasapa should be your teacher, yeah, sometimes in Mahayana Buddhism Mahakasapa is taken to be the new teacher, uh, and uh, th there's nothing about that here, uh, and uh, there's that secret transmission where uh, what is it, the Buddha smiles or there's a lotus flower, and, uh, whatever it is, and then kind of the transmission happens in that way. But that's mythology, that's legend, that's not actually from the suttas. So. Okay, I just go on. Uh, then the Buddha said to the mendicants, uh, perhaps even a single mendicant has doubt or uncertainty regarding the Buddha, the teaching, the Sangha, the path or the practice. Uh, so ask mendicants, uh, don't regret it later, thinking we were in the teacher's presence and we weren't able to ask the Buddha's question. When this was said, the mendicants kept silent. So here is the Buddha just uh, uh, giving the monks and the nuns and everyone a final chance to ask questions. Yeah, and uh, the point of this is perhaps just to show that the teachings are complete. There is nothing really to ask, yeah? They have already asked everything and everything is clear. Uh, the teachings have, uh, uh, there is, um, uh, uh, you, you see but you, you don't see, kind of, yeah? Everything is there, there's nothing to be added or taken away like we saw the other day. Uh, and uh, so that is really what uh, this is uh, pointing out perhaps. Uh, it is complete, there's nothing more to ask. Everybody keeps silent. And then we come to the last word of the Buddha. Then the Buddha said to the mendicants, Come now, mendicants, I say to you all, all things come to an end. Uh, persist 
with diligence. These were the realized one's last words. So, uh, this is kind of important. Yeah? The last words of the Buddha, you can imagine that the very last things he says will be significant. Uh, he won't say something that is meaningless, like last words. Uh, so this obviously is very important. And the way to regard these last words is as a summary of his entire teaching here. This is really a summary of everything the Buddha taught uh, in a very concise form. Uh, the first part here, all things come to an end. Uh, this is vaya dhamma, sankara. Vaya, sankara is a condition, are all the conditioned phenomena in the world. Uh, vaya dhamma, vaya means like uh, ending, yeah, or stopping, or ceasing, or disintegrating. Dhamma means nature. Uh, all conditioned phenomena have the nature to come to an end, to disintegrate, to fall apart. Uh, this is what the Buddha is saying here. Uh. So this is a summary of his teachings. Uh. So this is, if you like, like the right view. Uh. Yeah, so this is the view he lays down. And the second part, uh, strive on with diligence, or persist with, with diligence. Uh. This is like what you have to do as a consequence of that right view. Uh. So the right view first, all things have a, uh, will pass away. And this is the things I was talking about today downstairs in the Dhamma talk earlier on. Uh. This idea how powerful this rec recollection is, uh, that things always fall, fall, fall away, fall apart, uh, uh, are, are unreliable, are uncertain, are going to let you down at the end of the day. It's such an important thing. And the way to think about this is actually very profound, but the, the, a good way of thinking about this uh, is to start out, as I said down, down the bottom, with the world of the five senses. Uh, yeah, the ordinary experiential world that we have every day, the seen, the heard, the, s the touched, the five sense world. Uh, in other words, everything around us. Uh, to start with that, uh, start with the things that are easy to deal with, yeah, the things that you read in a newspaper, yeah, and see if you're able to deal with impermanence. Uh, and then gradually make, make it come closer to you uh, until you are able to see everything in the world as unreliable and impermanent. Uh, and the consequence of that is that you tend to withdraw into a more spiritual lifestyle. You find refuge within yourself rather than outside. Uh, and, but that is only the beginning. I didn't say that downstairs because I thought I, I don't want to scare people too much. Uh, but that's only the beginning, yeah? Because the outer world it's quite easy to see that the outer world is unreliable. We get that. It's so obvious that people die. It's so obvious that things fall apart. We understand it, at least a little bit, not fully, because we still get surprised when it happens. Oh no, I've got cancer. What do you expect? Of course you've got cancer. It's kind of hard, it's hard to accept, yeah, fully. But, you know, it might be here already. So, but that is still easy compared to the even deeper idea of all things being conditioned and being impermanent. Uh, because ultimately you take a refuge within yourself, but even that refuge isn't the final refuge. Uh, because even the inner phenomena within yourself, they too ultimately are subject to change. So it's only like a temporary refuge until then uh, ultimately you have the full insight into all conditioned phenomena. Uh, and that is where you attain Nibbana. But the inner refuge, the good thing about that is that it is part of the step towards understanding uh, the full reality of things. Uh, so you take the inner refuge, uh, you practice the Satipatthanas, maybe you have some success in Samadhi or whatever, and you go into your true home. That was Ajahn Shah's famous statement about meditation. You, you find your true home inside, uh, because it really feels like you find a true home. Feel completely safe within yourself, happy, blissful, free of all the problems and difficulties in the world. Coming into the reality of your real home within yourself. Uh, so you start with that, and then ultimately that is also the path to seeing things fully. Vaya dhamma sankara. All things are subject to impermanence, to decay, to ending, to cessation. This is what he is saying here. And it's an extraordinarily powerful idea that this is the right view that we start out with. And I would really encourage you to reflect on that, because it becomes a very, I think, a very useful way of helping you on the path. Uh, it's the kind of right view that makes right intention happen as a consequence of it. Uh, and then based on that, because you have right view, persist with diligence. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is apamadena sampadeta in Pali. Apamada means something like uh, heedfulness, 
carefulness, circumspection, uh, the opposite of being negligent yeah, or, or, be, or not caring about things, uh, but being careful in what you do. Live with wisdom, live with care. This is kind of what he is saying here. And then through that care, you will have success on the Buddhist path. It's precisely because you care about things uh, that success will arise as a consequence. Uh. So persist with diligence. What does it mean? Well, really what it means is practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. <coughs> Practice the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, practice the uh, gradual training, uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh, that is what he's saying here. Start off with right view, and then the practice comes as a consequence. Uh. So, very, so that is maybe all you need. Uh. Yeah, that's all you need to remember about Buddhism. Uh. And if you remember that much, uh, then uh, you pretty much remember the whole teaching, as long as you are able to kind of draw out the implications of this. Uh, Vaya Dhamma Sankara Appamadena Sampadeta. A very beautiful teaching here. It's very useful to be able to contract the teachings into a few simple things that you can actually remember, because if there's too much, sometimes you just get confused, you don't know what to remember, uh, and you kind of lose track of things. Uh, I often say to people, there's only one thing you need to remember in Buddhism, remember kindness. If you can remember that much, then you're doing really well. Uh, but people can't even remember that, yeah? It's true, isn't it? Uh, because sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes we get too many things happening in our life and we lose even the most basic things. Uh, so we need to come back to the Dhamma again and again and again and again. So, uh, there you are. That is the uh, last word of the Buddha. And then what happens next uh, is then the Buddha entered the first jhana. Then uh, and then there's a whole sequence of going into the various jhanas, up to the full cessation, back down again, which I have all contracted. Uh, and then eventually he entered the fourth jhana, the fourth absorption. Uh, and emerging from that, the Buddha immediately became fully extinguished. Uh. So the Buddha became extinguished. Uh, and uh, uh, that was it. And then people after that started to cry. That's what happened next. Uh, no, the Buddha has passed away too soon. Uh, yeah, the eye of the world has disappeared. That's what happens after this. Uh, except for the Arahants and the Noble Ones, uh, they were kind of standing by and saying, why are you crying? There's no need to cry, etc. But uh, maybe we can speculate just a little bit about why the Buddha entered these absorptions. Why didn't he just pass away and enter, become fully extinguished? Uh, what is all this business about all the absorptions and all of this, all the jhanas? According to the sutta, there's a long list. He goes all the way up to the cessation, then he comes down again, and then he goes up again. Uh, and it's all a bit, uh, he doesn't say anywhere why he does that. Uh, is it added later on? Is it true? Did he actually do this? Uh, and uh, it's, I don't think anyone really knows why, it ha why this happened. And maybe the commentaries have some comments on this. Uh, but uh, it could be that uh, uh, the, you know, if you go into the absorptions, then your body is really, really relaxed and really at ease. Uh, and uh, maybe the Buddha wanted his, you know, would like his body to kind of be in an inspiring state after he died. Uh, and if you want your body to be in an inspiring state, uh, then going into the absorptions might be the best way to do that. Uh, it's like you die with a very peaceful expression on your face, the most peaceful expression imaginable. Uh, and then when people see him, they will remember him as the person he actually was. Uh, and that would maybe inspire people. This is just my theory, uh, and other people have other theories, uh, but that's one possibility. Yes, please. Uh. <laughs> yeah. He says in the sutta that uh, Buddha entered the first absorption, went up, yeah. went down, went up yeah. again, and exit at yeah. the fourth jhana. Yeah. So I, I read also. Yeah. But then, how do the lay people or the people yeah. who are witnessing his passing away knows that he has gone into the first jhana? Yeah. Went the up and come down, went up again and exited from there. Yeah. How do people know? Yeah. And then there's how they put it in yeah. the sutta. How yeah. do people know? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a question of yeah. us. It's a good question. And I, I'm not sure if anyone knew, but the, the story is that uh, some of the monks who were there, they could read minds. Yeah? So one of, the, one of the monks who was there was Anuruddha. And Anuruddha, was, he was an arahant and he was uh, full of supernormal powers. Uh, and uh, actually it says in the sutta, it says that uh, Ananda says at one point, oh now the Buddha has uh, entered Parinibbana. 
And then Anuruddha replies, no, he has not entered Parinibbana yet, he's attained cessation. So from that, you get the feeling that Anuruddha is kind of monitoring what is going on, yeah, what is happening here. And then, uh, so this, this is how it was supposed to be known. Uh, yeah? But whether it is a legend or whether it is uh, real, I don't actually know. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, are you, uh, how do you feel now? Do you feel sad the Buddha has passed away? <laughs> It's like seeing a movie, yeah, when you see a movie at the end you feel really sad, even though it's got nothing to do with reality. Still, now you see the Buddha passed away, oh, you feel a bit sad about that. The Buddha passed away, even though it's already happened two and a half thousand years ago. Huh? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, please. John? Yes, sir. So, the question among the Buddhists is always this. After his passing away, is fully extinguished. That means, where is the Buddha? Or there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> where is the Buddha? Where is the Buddha now? What happened to him? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so they. Uh, but the point is, and this is kind of, this is, Buddhism is very profound, remember that. So these questions are actually very profound. And one of the things, the unanswered questions, and there's a reason why the Buddha didn't answer these questions, is the question, does the Tathagata, the Buddha, does he exist after death? Does he not exist after death? Does he both exist and not exist? What does that mean? That's, that's kind of, that sounds really amazing, doesn't it? Does he neither exist nor not exist after death? So these are, even the questions are kind of mind-boggling. What does it mean to neither exist nor not exist? I'm not sure what that means. It means some kind of different reality or something like that. And the Buddha refused to answer. Remember that? He refused to answer. He said, no, this, I, I'm not going to answer those questions. But now you are asking me to answer you exactly the same question. <laughs> Is that fair? You should have asked the Buddha. <laughs> so, and the reason why the Buddha refused to answer is because people misunderstand when you give the answer. Yeah, this is the problem. People don't get it. So, if I, and and this is the problem. And the reason is, and the reason for that is because if uh, most of us we have a sense of self. And that sense of self blocks our ability to appreciate something so profound. Because once you give an answer, you will interpret that in terms of that sense of self. And that is where we tend to go wrong. So remember, so instead of thinking about the Buddha in that way, uh, the best thing to do is to think of the Buddha as a parinibbana. Is, first of all, nibbana itself is an extinguishment of the defilements. Yeah? That is what nibbana is. Not parinibbana, but nibbana. When you become an arahant, you extinguish the defilements. And when you become, when you come, come to Paranibbana, it is, it is in a sense just a furthering of that. It says in the suttas, it is the ending of the five khandhas. Uh, yeah? The five khandhas come to an end. Uh, and from the suttas point of view, that is all there is. Uh, there is nothing more than the five khandhas. Uh, the final extinguishment uh, is just the ending of everything. Uh, yeah? This is really what it is in from the, uh, from the sutta point of view. And the, the reason why the Buddha doesn't answer that question, uh, he doesn't actually say it in that way, or he does say it in some places, but he very rarely answers it, uh, is precisely because that it is, uh, it, uh, it, it, is al it is almost impossible to understand that uh, from the point of view of an ordinary person. Uh. So the best thing to think about arahantship, or even paranibbana, is to think of it as happiness. Uh. The Buddha calls it happiness, yeah, because you give up all the sufferings in life, you give up all the defilements that cause suffering, yeah? and that is the most important thing. Yeah? Do you want to achieve happiness or not? Yeah? And when you do a little bit of meditation practice, you start to see why that is the case. I mentioned yesterday, you may remember, I was saying that uh, when you meditate a little bit, uh, things cease a little bit, uh, things become more peaceful, uh, you have less thinking in your mind, your body starts to disappear. How do you feel? You feel really good. Uh, the more things disappear in your meditation, the happier you become. And this is how you can start to get an idea of why total ending, total cessation can be happiness. There is a sutta 
in the uh, Majjhima Rekha, it's called the Bahuveda, Bahuvedana Sutta, the many kinds of feeling. Uh, and it talks about feelings, how feelings uh, come in a hierarchy. Uh, and you start with the ordinary feelings of sensual pleasures, uh, then you go to the feelings of jhana, each one being higher than the next one. Uh, go to the feelings of the second jhana, still better, third jhana, all the way up to the neva sanya nasanya yatana, which is the, uh, this, the plane of neither perception, non-perception. Uh, yeah, we talked about that the other day. Uh, and then you go to the cessation of perception and feeling. And then the Buddha says, that is a higher happiness than the previous one, which was the neither perception, non-perception. And then how, how can that be happiness? Feeling has ceased. There's no feelings anymore. How can you have happiness when, uh, when there's no feelings? And the answer to that is that uh, uh, whether you feel or not uh, is not the point. The point is whether one thing is better than another. Yeah? So whatever state, whether it's feeling or non-feeling, whatever is preferable, that is the more happy state, even if you can't feel. Yeah, it's happy precisely because you can't feel, because feeling is a problem. Yeah? So you get rid of feeling, even better. This is what it means. So in that sutta, it is fairly obvious that the complete ending of things, actually, that is the highest kind of happiness. But that's hard to understand, isn't it? It's hard to kind of get that. And this is why, generally, the Buddha didn't actually answer that question. Uh, he kept quiet about it, because uh, it is very confusing and very hard to understand when you're used to a particular framework of thinking about things. Uh, am I making any sense to you? Uh, yeah? No? Uh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the, this is the happiness wherever you can find it, not only within feeling, but also outside of feeling. Yeah. So the ending of feeling yeah, is, uh, not, is not the happiness in terms of a felt experience, it's happiness in terms of an unfelt experience. Yeah? <laughs> so this is, this is, so it gets pretty, it gets profound, yeah? And this is kind of the point. Uh, well, it's not an unfelt experience. It's like it's like it's just unfelt. I was saying I was putting it the wrong way because it's not really an experience anymore. It's just happiness as something which is unfelt. Anyway, so this is when it gets profound and it gets really kind of uh, amazing. And sometimes you don't have to worry too much about these things uh, because if you worry too much about it, you m sometimes you just misunderstand. Uh, you don't know what's going on. Uh, so as long as you are happy and uh, you are moving towards happiness, uh, that's what really matters in the Buddhist life. You are moving towards happiness. Uh, if you feel that the Buddhist path is taking you towards happiness, then it is exciting, then it is interesting, then you will keep going. So just keep going. See what, where it takes you. Uh, yeah? And then as you do that, read a bit more suttas. Uh, gradually put it all together. Uh, don't expect all the answers before you start doing a little bit of practice. Uh, if the suttas make a little bit of sense, at the very least in terms of morality and kindness and these kind of things, uh, that's good enough to get you started, get you going. Uh, and then you, uh, uh, gra hopefully, gradually you get there. Uh, and then one day, uh, these things can be understood by anyone. Uh, yeah. And then you, you kind of bow down to the Buddha with tears in your eyes because you realize how beautiful it all is. Uh. Any more questions about this? Yes, please. Uh. When it's mentioned the Buddha immediately became uh, yeah. fully extinguished, does it mean that there was no more body for cremation to dispose? <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it just means that he, he got extinguished right there. It just means that, uh, it just means that uh, the, the, the mental aggregates ceased, came to an end. Yeah? The, men the, the mental, the mind came to an end. Bang, right there. That's what it means. Uh, so the body was still left. Uh, a uh, lifeless body uh, to be cremated by the disciples later on. Uh. Yeah, please. Yeah, Ajahn, uh, I have, I got asked about these questions from my friend. Um, yeah. So basically, he asked me when Buddha ceased to exist, since Buddha ceased to exist, so why do we still bow down to Buddha uh, Triple Gem? Because Buddha is no longer here, <coughs> so uh, I, I don't know how to answer that, and I have no answer for that too. <coughs> uh, thank you, Ajahn. Well, you, you you bow down to uh, 
what, what you are bowing down to is you are bowing down to the fact that you are bowing down to the historical Buddha, you are bowing down to someone who has passed away, there is no reason why you can't do that. Uh, yeah? You are not bowing down to a living Buddha, you are bowing down to someone who existed two and a half thousand years ago because he gave us these teachings. Uh, so you are bowing down to someone who is dead, really. Uh, but you are also bowing down, when you talk about the Buddha, you are bowing down to the idea of enlightenment, you are bowing down to all the ideas of what it means to be a Buddha. And uh, so, uh, in a sense, I guess we have a gratitude to the Buddha, even though he's passed away. Uh, still have gratitude for him. It's like when you go, you know, I, when you go to the grave of your parents or whatever. Uh, yeah, and you go to the grave, you put flowers on the grave of your parents. Uh, uh, you still put flowers. You're still paying respect to your parents in a sense, uh, uh, even though they passed away. Uh, doesn't mean you can't do that, even though they passed away. Uh, you can still kind of be respectful to them. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of the point. Uh, so uh, just because someone is dead, passed away, doesn't mean that you can't still respect them and have them as a teacher because he has bequeathed all the suttas to us and given us all of these things. Uh, so the, you know, the, the gift that the Buddha gave to the world is still available to us uh, and so for that reason we can still also have a sense of gratitude even though he's passed away and still respect him. Uh, I, don't think, I don't see a problem there with uh, you know, having respect for someone who's passed away. The Dhamma is certainly still around. Uh, Sangha still around, yeah? So those things are still still available there. Yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, I think the point there is that the, the Dhamma is only really valid if it has a Buddha behind it. Yeah, so the Dhamma as a teaching only has a meaning because it, because it was given by the Buddha. If the Dhamma becomes disconnected from the Buddha, then suddenly it doesn't have a connection to insight, to a real historical person anymore. Huh? So the Buddha is actually necessary in the background there, huh? as that which gives the Dhamma authenticity. Huh? Without the Buddha, no authenticity, no reality, no real insight, uh, no understanding of, of things as they actually are. Huh? So that's why the Buddha is important. It's very important. Uh, Buddhism is a based on the idea that the historical personality had a real insight into the nature of things. Uh, and if there isn't anyone who had that insight, uh, then the whole Dhamma becomes dodgy, because it's not based on a real, uh, real understanding of things. Uh, so it is based on that. So it is, you know, and that's why the Buddha uh, is, is actually very important uh, for that reason. Uh, yeah? Hmm. Yes? Uh, you always refer to the four Nikayas. I just yeah. want to find out how does the Sutta Nipata fall into place with okay. the Nikayas? Sure. Yeah, okay. okay. So the Sutta Nipata and the four Nikayas, what is the relationship? Uh, and uh, the Sutta Nipata is part of the Kudaka Nikaya, uh, yeah? the so called small collection, the short collection, which is the longest one of all. Uh, so the small collection is the biggest one, this is kind of one of the paradoxes, and that kind of tells you something about what has happened historically. Yeah? The fact that it's called the Kuduka Nikaya probably meant that early on it was tiny, tiny, tiny. And then they had to add, when they kind of came up with new books, they had to put them somewhere. So they didn't, they didn't know what to put them, so they put it all into the Kuduka Nikaya. So what was originally the smallest one became enormous after a while. Yeah? And now it is really large. The Kuduka Nikaya is the biggest of all the Nikayas. Uh. So the Sutta Nipata is in there. And the Kuduka Nikaya is very diverse. Uh, it has some of the things in the Kudaka Nikaya are very early and they come from early Buddhism, whereas some of it is very late. It, it will come maybe hundreds of years after the Buddha. <coughs> things like the Buddha Vangsa and the Charya Pitaka and uh, maybe the Patisambhidamaga. These are, Patisambhidamaga is like an Abhidhamma text, it really belongs with the Abhidhamma. And uh, the Buddha Vangsa is the history of the uh, various Buddhas in the past and these things. These are things that came a long time after the Buddha. Uh, but uh, some of these things are quite early, and the earliest parts of the Kudaka Nikaya are generally understood to be the Udana. Huh? You, know, you know the Udana? Yeah? Itivutaka. Huh? Itivutaka was, by the way, was collected by a lay woman, a lay Buddhist woman collected Itivutaka, which is kind of nice, yeah? And then she remembered that and she put it in with the, with the rest of the collection. Huh? Uh, Dhammapada. 
Yesterday we saw how some of the verses in the Majjhima Nikaya are found in the, in the Dhammapada. So there's a close, obviously it must be quite early here. Uh, but not everything in the Dhammapada is early. It's, these are collections. So some of it is late, some of it is earlier. Uh, and then you have the um, uh, Theragata and Terigata, the verses of the elder monks and nuns. Some of that is quite early. Uh, and then you have the Sutta Nipata. Uh, yeah, this is the earliest part of the Kudaka uh, Nikaya. Six books altogether, and everything else is quite a bit later. But even these are compilations that are a little bit, some of it is late, some of it is early. Uh, so with the Udana, for example, the verses tend to be earlier, whereas the uh, prose a narrative around the verses tend to be later. Uh, this has, can be shown by uh, ana analyzing the text. Uh, in the Sutta Nipata, the er it has five chapters, uh, the Sutta Nipata. The two last ones are likely to be the earliest. Uh, the two last ones are called the Attakavaga and the Parayanavaga. Attakavaga, a chapter of eights. Parayanavaga, the chapter on crossing, going beyond, crossing over. Uh, these two chapters have uh, parallels in Chinese translation, so they exist in Chinese language, uh, whereas the three first do not have parallels in Chinese language. Uh, they don't have parallels anywhere. So this is how you, you are know how that the f last two chapters are more likely to be authentic. Yeah. So if you want to read the most authentic part of the Sutta Nipata, read the last two chapters, Atakavaga, Parayanavaga. But some of the earlier suttas are also uh, uh, quite likely early uh, because they exist in many, um, also in other translations. Uh, and one of them is the Kagavisana Sutta, the rhin Rhinoceros Horn Sutta is one of those. Uh, uh, one of them is the Ratana Sutta. Ratana Sutta is quite likely to be early. Uh, uh, the Metta Sutta is in there. Yeah, uh, uh, you seem yeah, you know about all this. Yeah, Metta Sutta is in there. And the Metta Sutta, strangely, does not have a parallel in in Chinese. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Uh, yeah, with, uh, because Metta Sutta is one of the suttas that is very loved by people and, we're, and it has a lot of beautiful things in it. Uh, and yet somehow it doesn't have a parallel in Chinese. So we. Don't, it's uncertain whether it was taught by the Buddha or not. Uh, we, don't, we cannot really establish that with certainty here. Uh, it's kind of grayish kind of area. Then we have the Mahamangala Sutta, another important sutta in there. Yeah? And that one, I think parts of that one may... Does that have a parallel somewhere? I'm not sure now. Uh, I was, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I can't, cannot remember at the, at the moment. It's getting a bit, uh, bit vague. Uh, right there. But that is roughly, that gives you a rough idea of the earliest parts of that uh, and the later part. And some of the other suttas too, they have uh, uh, parallels, uh, but generally speaking, it's the last two chapters. Uh. So uh, there you are. But uh, sometimes you don't need to be too concerned about whether things are from the very earliest period. Uh, sometimes more important to see if something is reasonable, if it is good Dhamma. Yeah, sometimes you can tell that whether it's a bit dodgy or not. It feels a bit dodgy, then you kind of leave it to one side. But if it is good Dhamma and it's inspiring and helps you in your practice, you can use it. Uh, yeah, no reason why you cannot. Uh, and even sometimes you may, even though you may consider yourself a Theravada Buddhist, sometimes you may find some Mahayana literature that is very inspiring and very nice. Uh, there's no reason why you can't use that, uh, as long as you don't kind of, uh, you know, uh, hold on too strongly to specific Mahayana doctrines, perhaps, or whatever. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, you don't have to be to com complete Theravada fundamentalists, yeah, that's not, there's, no <laughs> there's no need to do that. Uh. Anyway, shall we have a break? Let's have a break and uh, come back in about half an hour, and then, or 25 minutes or so, and then have do some meditation together afterwards. Uh.